The best of our knowledge explores topics on learning, education, and research. Coming up, what's your favorite scary story? We'll speak with Jeremy Dauber, author of American Scary, the book chronicles the history of horror in America. Scary materials uh, could really tell you a story about a culture. And we'll learn about how libraries are creating sensory-focused spaces. I'm Lucas Willard, host of The Best of Our Knowledge. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. The horror genre is embedded in American history. Our guest is Jeremy Dauber. His latest book is American Scary, a history of horror from Salem to Stephen King and beyond. After his previous book chronicled comic books, I asked why he turned his attention to the supernatural. The first was that ever since I was a kid, I was both fascinated with horror, who are almost obsessed with reading Stephen King and reading uh, a lot of horror short fiction when I could find it, but also terrified of it. And I, I was very afraid of seeing a scary movie and things like that. So there was really always this interesting push and pull even within me that I uh, was something that I was always interested in exploring. Um, and, you know, as I got older and, uh, you know, some one set of fears were replaced by sort of the more grown up kinds of fears and uh, concerns and things like that, uh, I became as I started teaching about culture and about literature, uh, really interested in the way in which um, certain kinds of materials and particularly scary materials uh, could really tell you a story about a culture. Um, that the way in which what you are afraid of, I'm talking about uh, culturally or nationally or societally, um, really tells you something a lot about sort of what the culture values and thinks about and things like that. So uh, I started teaching about it and I said, you know what, I could probably tell this kind of American story this way. And, and that was what set me off to the races, so to speak. A big part of the book is how in the different eras of American history, uh, that's reflected in art. It's reflected in the kinds of stories. What is the focus of a scary story or a scary film? But going all the way back to colonial America and the early American days, what were some of the themes that were present in literature but also carried into horror? What stuck with American audiences when... You know, not as many people, one, knew how to read as they do today. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, and one of the things that I was really interested in doing was saying how, as you're saying, sort of real life circumstances, real life fears, and what we might call fiction or we might not call fiction, um, really kind of blurred together and overlapped. And that's the way I tell the story, right? So, um, you know, you have, uh, as you say, sort of we have a, a colonial history of America, right? You have these people coming over. Uh, and many of these people are, are uh, religious refugees, right? They, they're, they're coming to worship in their own way. And that way is, a, for many of them, is a puritanical way, which is shrouded all about it with this fear of hell and damnation, right? So, um, you know, uh, these sermons that are being preached to them uh, are, you know, are, are, are full of, uh, you know, hellfire and fear and all these kinds of things. And, and they live in a world in which they feel uh, that they are in a narrow bridge between sort of the possibilities of salvation and damnation and that the devil is all about them. Uh, uh, and that's, that's one thing that is coming over from Europe, right? Uh, and is coming into this new world of, of forests and, 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 you know, animals that they're not familiar with and indigenous people who they are coming to some kind of arrangement with. Um, but also this notion that maybe there are these diabolic pacts with the people who live next door and sometimes even in their house. Uh, and, and, and that sort of sense of a balancing between sort of the fear that's big and out there and the fear that's right next door and right in your house, that's always the story of kind of American fe fear in general, but of American fear. And it really comes to a head in these witchcraft uh, uh, friend hysteria and then the subsequent trials, right? The fear that here these people right next door are making deals with the devil. Sure. And, and the Salem witch trials, there's still movies that are being made today about early witches and, and all of the rest of it. I'm thinking of the 2015 movie Witch, uh, which right. takes a very uh, unique look in capturing <laughs> the dialogue and the way that they are believed to have spoken back then throughout the whole film. 
Uh, but these are also themes, although they're early in American history, have carried on through. Maybe some updates here and there in their style, but the <laughs> core to these themes has remained. And why do you think that uh, scary stories in particular do have such staying power? Why are they still so uh, powerful, even if it's a story that might have origins from 200 years ago. I, I think, Lucas, you know, you put it exactly right, is that there are these continuities and we wouldn't keep coming back to these stories if they didn't still have some resonance with us. Uh, and, you know, if, if we just even take sort of the story of witchcraft, right, witches can be uh, like a lot of monsters or a lot of scary figures, they can be used in all sorts of different ways, right? They can be about sort of the fear of the person who's sort of a little different from us and they're sort of out on the margins, right? It can be a very frequently uh, about the fear of women. In the 1990s, uh, with movies like The Craft or something like that, you know, you have this reclamation of, or in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, of which for being sort of girl power kind of thing, right? And and But that speaks to this kind of uneasy tension about gender um, that, that really is a story that, that sort of continues in its own way. Um, there's the fear of a kind of mass uh, hysteria. You know, once the, in Salem, once this starts, it really kind of rolls out of control. And this idea that uh, first, uh, you know, you have these thing, these possible evil among us, but also that sometimes the persecutors can get caught and become even worse than whatever the threat was. Uh, so all of these things, you know, they can play themselves out in so many different ways over the course of our American story, but they're all there, you know, and they're all continue to be there. So Salem becomes sort of endlessly bountiful in that kind of way. So how did the advancements in technology, the Industrial Revolution, how did that change American horror stories uh, when we've moved out of the small agrarian communities into larger cities? Yeah, a, a wonderful question, because like you're saying, uh, you know, you're com we, we can say that there are these technological changes and that they, in some sense, allow for major society changes, societal changes, too. So, you know, take, for example, around the turn of the 20th century, you have sort of the electric city, Chicago, right? And it can be a city uh, because of this electricity in certain kinds of ways. I mean, you have cities before electricity, but Chicago really. But in this sort of modern light, right, we have shadows, uh, that come to and sort of, you know, one of the stories that I tell is about sort of this murderer, H.H. H. Holmes, who sort of operates this hotel uh, in the in the shadow of the World's Fair and people, you know, check in and they don't check out. Right. You know, that's what uh, and, and, and part of the reason that that can happen is that these big cities allow anonymity. If, you know, if someone goes missing in a small town. You know, it's pretty easy to see that they're not there. But if someone leaves and they go to the city, you know, they could get swallowed up and people can take advantage of that. And that's a kind of horror story that really comes because of these societal changes. And and one of the things I try and track is, you know, with each different sort of new uh, uh, change, uh, there become new kinds of fears, new versions maybe of those old ones, but new fears uh, as a result. Um, yeah. So it's, it, it's great to think about that. I'm thinking of what you said about shadows and then with Shadows and darkness comes themes of claustrophobia and themes of abandonment and other things that are really core to when we think of the modern horror story or anybody who might have seen a horror movie. Uh, there are elements that are traced back to certain eras, and I think that's fascinating. One of the genres, you mentioned the turn of the century, that I love the most is weird fiction. Mm -hmm. And from early writers like Arthur Machen with the great god Pan, and sort of surreal, dreamlike stories that then advanced and progressed into uh, the H.P. Lovecraft area. Uh, when did horror start moving out of maybe uh, religion and out of uh, what's on this earth and into the supernatural beyond sort of your classic ghosts and vampires and legends? that go back centuries, when did horror start to get a little stranger, start to think about the cosmos, those kinds of elements? So I think you're absolutely right to sort of present this as, let's say, almost two different kinds of cosmoses, or I don't know what the plural of cosmos is, cosmos, I, I don't know. Um, but and in, in the first, right, we have this sort of supernatural sort of cosmos, but it's ordered, it's metaphysical, right? There's a god, there's a devil, they're in conflict or you know, over the human soul, but it's sort of... A, you know, and really in this 
sort of neo-paganism of the 1890s, the turn of the century, with people like Mackin and Lovecraft and people like that, you have this, here is, and, and even sort of this new turn to science fiction with H.G. Wells, and then that makes its way to America. You have this sense of, there is this wide universe with stuff still beyond the ken of ordinary people, right? But it's hostile and unforbidding, and in some sense, uncaring. It's sort of, you know, uh, it, it, it's much bigger than we can possibly imagine. And even to look at it, if you look at it for a second, like, you'll go mad, you know, because of the cosmic insignificance, and they'll just squash you like flies, right, if you, not even thinking about it almost. So that aspect, I think, very much has to do, as you're saying, uh, Lucas, with a kind of move away from God as a center of the universe, or the traditional God, I should say, as a, as a center uh, of the universe. And what that also leads to is the increasing possibility that we see more and more in horror now um, of randomness, right? A lot of horror before, in 1905, there's an there's a essay about the ghost story, and, it, and this person, whose name was Olivia Dunbar, says, every ghost story is a story of revenge, okay? Um, which leads to a kind of order. You know, you do something bad, and then you get revenge, right? Uh, there's some sense of, right? But Lovecraft... And that, and a good chunk, not all, but a good chunk of 20th century horror and 21st century horror says, nope, you know why we have, uh, uh, you know why you're being suffering? Because you went down the wrong road or because you happened to be at home or because you did the, you know, you just made a wrong turn. It's not because you did anything bad. And that's a much different sense of how the universe works than a traditionally religious one. So in addition to how world events shaped horror, I'm also curious about how horror stories were published. Um, books were once very scarce and very expensive. Then you started seeing horror stories appear in periodicals and in magazines. Uh, and then eventually it led to sort of specialized uh, publishing companies like uh, Arkham House, which were really good at showcasing strange stories. Um, how did the horror story evolve with the medium in which it was being Presented, and I haven't even mentioned radio and television. <laughs> well, uh, you are asking such great questions because I a hundred percent think that the issue of medium or platform or technology, whatever, that's so central to this story, right? And it's also central to the way in which horror becomes, in some ways, narrow cast, even though it's very, very popular, but as a particular kind of genre. So when I, when I say, oh, who are some of the great horror writers in the book, well, people like Nathaniel Hawthorne or Edith Warden or Henry James, alongside Stephen King and H.P. Lovecraft. And, you know, people are like, really? You know, and I say, yes, because, you know, when in, in, in this earlier period, even right through the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century, you know, people just publish ghost stories alongside uh, other kinds of stories in general interest magazines like The Atlantic or Harper's. That's where we see many of these stories. Um, but then with the rise of the pulp magazines, you know, you have this just increasing explosion of all sorts of different themed magazines. Oh, you like your Westerns? You can have a magazine that's just Westerns, right? You like your weird stories? You can have a Weird Tales magazine, right? A pulp magazine. And this famous one, as you, as you know, of course, that has Lovecraft uh, very prominently featured in it. Um, and so increasingly you have this sort of level of specialization. This also comes, as you said, books can be expensive, right? In the middle of the 20th century, we really have the development of the paperback book, so you can have much cheaper books that are available. And then you can have, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, whole lines of paperback original horror fiction, right? I mean, and you can just have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books in that, in that kind of way that are sort of easily accessible. So uh, the, 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 the platform really, really makes a huge difference um, in the way that uh, people consume this. And then, you know, bookstores begin to develop sort of aisles. They say, oh, you're interested in horror, go to the horror aisle, you know, and, and read it that way, which is, you know, has its pluses and its minuses for who reads and how, but it's a huge development. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. If you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Jeremy Dauber, author of American Scary, A History of Horror from Salem to Stephen King and Beyond. One thing that's not a horror story that you reference in the book and I thought was particularly interesting is Easy Rider, the motorcycle from, from the 1960s, which is seen as a hugely influential small production uh, with a small cast and it's stylish and it's got, uh, now we look at the music in the film in particular, 
But to me, I look at Easy Rider and I can easily see the connection between a small movie like that into the small horror productions of the 1970s, the slasher films. You have Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Halloween or those kinds of uh, productions. So why did, I guess, how did the limitations of the cost of producing film influence the kinds of stories that were being made into movies. And then some of these became cult favorites and still have sequels today. I mean, what a great question. I mean, first, I just want to come back to this thing that you said, that, that, that the book, you know, tells the story of what kind of unsettles America, right? It's not just monsters, although there's plenty of monsters in it, but it's not just, you know, so a movie like Easy Rider, even though it's not a, a, a horror movie where people are jumping out, it's this very disquieting movie, uh, I, I, I'm suggesting to a lot of America, saying, well, wait a minute, here are these countercultural hippies, um, but, you know, who seem to be against everything uh, that, uh, you know, white picket fence, post-war, greatest generation people stand for, but... They're calling themselves Captain America. They're living about, you know, the spirit of America. They actually seem to be, in their own ways, very uh, patriotic. Uh, and isn't that a kind of disquieting challenge, right? So it was, in, you know, and, and so, of course, then from the other side, they say, well, they're a challenge, so, you know, we have to kill them. I apologize for spoiling the end of the movie for anyone who hasn't seen it since, like, 1969. But that's, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and that's, of course, terrifying for the people who are more sympathetic, Right. And saying, well, 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 here's the society that, that, that sees us and is really going to be very hostile to us. So there's that aspect, too. But one of the things that you're pointing out, I think 100 percent right. This is a, not an expensive movie to make. It's sort of a uh, and and this is also a great tradition in horror filmmaking. Right. Is to say, look, um, we can do this sort of fast. We can do this cheap. We can either do this to kind of uh, really just put out something that is just firmly about conventions or something which is really kind of very experimental and different uh, in its own way. And 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 uh, you mentioned the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? This is not uh, a high-budget, expensive production. It's a production that in its own way follows an easy rider, like you're alluding to about saying the American family is sort of presents its own sort of twisted, parodic version of that family, right? It's a critique. Um, but... You know, that's okay because lots of people love horror and we can do a very low budget and we can make a tremendous amount, at least by comparison, a tremendous amount of money. They can be intensely profitable. And you see that with companies uh, to this day, like Bloomhouse and things like that, you know, where they'll make uh, a movie for, uh, uh, you know, a very small budget and it can make dozens, if not sometimes even hundreds of, of times its money back. But really the thing that's so much interesting as you're alluding to is – it allows for these kinds of experimentation. Oh, there's not that much money. We can, you know, we can kind of do what we want. Um, and that really can set new aesthetic boundaries. And once in a while, one of those movies becomes a breakthrough hit and becomes a huge franchise. The, the one that comes to mind for me is I saw the first Saw film when I was in high school. And at the time, that was praised as being at least the parts of the movie not to give any spoilers, but there's people who are trapped in a small room. Um, <laughs> and then there's sort of everything that happens around outside of it. But then that spawned a whole series with a million sequels and everything like that. So uh, do those, in your mind, constraints, if you will, uh, lead to a lot of innovation? And particularly is that seen more often in the horror genre than maybe some other kinds of storytelling. Yeah, I, you know, I think that that's a great question. I, I, I don't want to speak for every other kind of genre, right? But I do think that there are some genres that, uh, you know, audiences are willing to see um, even if the production, you know, when there's innovation on a very small production budget. You know, it's hard to imagine what a, in this day and age, a million dollar action movie looks like, right? That's a little bit, Marty, you know, he's like, oh, well, they're using matchbox cars or something like that and banging them into each other. It, it seems a little hard. Like, um, you know, uh, I think that, and that goes in two directions though with horror, which is sometimes audiences are willing and have been willing to sit through really schlocky kind of material um, that doesn't right, creatively innovate. But you also have a tremendous amount of fans who are saying, I'm willing to sit through 15 of these to find a Saw or a Paranormal Activity or a Blair Witch Project 
uh, and that really kind of move the the whole direction of film forward. I'm a little older than you, and so I remember being in the theater when Blair Witch Project came out, and besides also having being terrified by this kind of found footage thing, which at that point was pretty new, um, saying, you know, I'm really in the presence of something different, something that's going to change the way. And and, and lots of people felt that way. There's an immensely profitable movie. Um, and, you know, off to the races, we went with these kinds of things. To you, what makes an effective horror story? Are there certain elements that you recognize uh, as something that's critical to telling a good ghost story, horror story, uh, slasher film, you name it? You know, I, I think it's a, it's a great question because um, I think that so many, you know, fear is takes so many different forms. Uh, and as a result, each of the uh, endeavors in eliciting different kinds of scary, right, are going to have different sort of criteria to them. Uh, I would never go to an Alfred Hitchcock movie uh, and say, you know what, there should have been more chainsaws, right? I mean, that, that would be <laughs> that would be kind of ruining, right? On the other hand, um, if you are a gore hound and you're going to a movie that's sort of, that's what they're going to do, um, you know, you want to see that the, that, that the technical aspects of that are really sort of well put together. Um, and, and, you know, it would be wrong to say, well, uh, I can't believe how bloody that movie was. That would just be sort of approaching it in the wrong way. So, uh, you know, I think on those levels it depends, but to me, one of the things that's the most interesting in sort of in any of these, right, is this combination of immersion and alienation that really comes out, right? Where you're saying, I, I can't watch, I must watch. Um, and that, I think, that, you know, that's something for a lot of different kinds of art, but certainly for horror, right, is, you know, I, 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 I'm, look, I'm putting my hand over my eyes, but I'm, uh, I'm also looking through my fingers at the same times. Uh, and I think that there's that sense in, in a, I'm not going to say in everything because I'm an academic and you never say in everything, but a, a lot of, a, a lot of horror. There's that push pull dynamic in an interesting way. Do you have a favorite horror story? Um, you know, every, I guess I, I get asked that question as you can imagine a lot now that the book is out today. Uh, um, uh, and, and, um, I have a different answer every day, but, uh, I will say that the movie that I find to be the most American horror movie. It may not be the best, but it's certainly the most. The one that is a 1950s movie called Night of the Hunter, which for some people, they might not remember that it's the one with the preacher who has love tattooed on one knuckle, so on one hand and, and hate on the other. Yes, exactly. Um, and, you know, we, uh, and, and I think that that movie, which is kind of a, based on a true crime story about a Lonely Hearts killer, uh, and then sort of, transmogrified beyond all recognition into kind of a dark fable about American hatred um, is really just every time I watch it, uh, uh, I see more and I, and I, I'm just more in awe uh, of, of what it does. So that, you know, maybe that's my favorite, but it's certainly one of the ones that I think if you want to see in a, a movie that's about American horror, uh, I envy you your one, your first watching of this movie. If you haven't seen it. I love that film. I absolutely yeah. love that film. It's, terrifying <laughs> and, and it's not necessarily a gory film it's a heavy film i would say that's right is how i would describe it but uh jeremy dauber thank you so much for taking the time uh the book is called american scary a history of horror from salem to stephen king and beyond thanks so much again for for speaking with me i appreciate it thanks it was a wonderful conversation i loved it thank you Jeremy Dauber is the author of American Scary, A History of Horror from Salem to Stephen King and Beyond, published by Algonquin. I'm Lucas Willard. You're listening to the best of our knowledge. Having your nose in a book is a great way to wind down, but the Clifton Park Half Moon Public Library in upstate New York has created a space for patrons who process the world differently. Madeline Reynolds spoke with librarian assistant Barbara Reese about the library's new sensory room. This sensory room was designed as a calming space. There are different types of sensory rooms, but for our purposes, we felt that a calming space was the best use of this. The world is a loud, busy, sensory, um, intense space. Um, and we wanted to make sure that everyone in our community was able to utilize the library and have a space that they could go to if they needed a few minutes to kind of drop out, um, reset, 
regulate a little quiet time before they kind of go back out into the world. So can we experience these together? Can you let me feel these, touch these, experience them? Absolutely. Some of the items that we have on our bookshelf, a lot of them are tactile experiences, but if you're looking for a sense of sound and you need that, we have these visual tactile tubes. And if you want, you can pick one up and you can see not only is it visual, additionally it makes the sounds right. so that you have the visual experience, mm -hmm. the tactile experience. Some of the tubes are filled with balls, mm -hmm. some are filled with bells, and they're a great way to retain focus and yeah. have that sense of something happening. Mm -hmm. On the floor we have liquid floor panels mm -hmm which you can walk across and you can see how the image moves as you walk across it. So it's just kind of a visual sensory feeling. And as you do that, you walk up to the tactile wall panels and you'll notice each of the wall panels have a different feel. Some are smooth, some are bumpy. So they give whatever the user needs a different experience when you touch them. One of the more popular ones has the hanging chains. They have real weight to them because they're actual chains and you can hear how they hit right. the wall when, when you touch them. So that's also a very popular one of the set. Mm -hmm. Some of the other ones are softer. This is almost like almost like turf. It almost kind of looks like turf. Yes, me, yes. So it, it feels kind of like turf. Very, very stiff, very hard. So if somebody's looking for a more intense feeling to calm down as opposed to something that's softer, the bumps yeah. on some of the uh, items, again, you can just rub your hands across. And if you rub it one way, it can be smooth, but another way, it can be bumpy. And then our wall labyrinth is a giant spinning maze and you can see as well as hear the balls kind of moving throughout the maze mm -hmm. and you can manipulate it so that you can get to the different colors okay. um, and move them to the different spaces. Mm -hmm. The best of our knowledge is Madeline Reynolds speaking with Barbara Reese of the Clifton Park Half Moon Public Library in upstate New York. This has been The Best of Our Knowledge, episode 1775. The Best of Our Knowledge is a national production of WAMC, Northeast Public Radio. Thanks to associate producer Madeline Reynolds. The latest on all national productions programs is available via the Airwaves newsletter and our flagship station's website, wamc.org. Until next time, I'm Lucas Willard. <laughs>